Jonathan Franzen is here. His new novel, The Corrections, won the National Book Award for fiction. Critics have hailed the book as a literary sensation. The Atlantic Monthly said, Franzen is a wizard, endlessly inventive. He was recently surrounded by a media frenzy when he expressed hesitation about being selected by Oprah Winfrey's book club. He has been named one of the 20 writers for the 21st century by the New Yorker magazine. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome back. Thanks. Uh, congratulations first. Thank you. National Book Award. It's the first time I've been happy in two months, these last two days. It's, it's, yeah. it's really fun. Uh, it, it's a terrible question, but I mean, it means what? It means what? Um, well, five, five of your peers have looked at 400 books that were published in a given year, and they've said, we like this one best. Uh, it means I don't have to worry about whether I will ever get a National Book Award, which is something that, you know. It's nice to get past. It's nice to get past, yeah. yeah. Then you can begin to think about a Nobel Prize or for literature or something like that. No, I'll just stop and stop <laughs> worrying altogether right here. You think about things like this. I mean, not, not awards, but you think about, you think about a body of work. You think about your place as a novelist. You grapple in print and otherwise about where the novel stands, the cultural irrelevance of it, uh, why that's true, how the novel fits in today's contemporary media-obsessed society, all of those kinds of things. I do. Uh, I have a sort of a devil of self-conscious me in, uh, in me about all that. Um, and I don't know, I think, I think that comes from growing up in the Midwest with parents who expected um, their children to do something useful. And uh, uh, writing novels is useless. That's, that's the wonderful thing about it. Um, it's useless? Well, I think it is. It's purely, I mean, it doesn't serve any, any social end beyond entertaining people. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's not building bridges. It's not oh, I see. Curing, it's not curing the sick. It's not, uh, you know, uh, cleaning up uh, the ghetto. It's, it's uh, it, by a utilitarian yeah. but view, my, it's, it's a useless thing to do. But my belief about you is that you believe it ought to be more and can be more. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I think I, think I labored under the... Uh, the misconception that it can be and should be for for many years, um, and there was a point at which uh, the available evidence was that you know it wasn't having much of a social effect. Um, people didn't look to novels for you know news about the culture in the same way that, uh, and 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 uh, they didn't read it for reporting on issues of the day because TV does that so much better. And at that point, I began to feel. Um, why am I doing this? How can I justify my existence? And that, again, refers back to that, uh, what I'd grown up being, yeah. uh, expecting to do with my life, which was something of social utility. And uh, one of the reasons I think a lot about the, the, the place of the novelist in the culture and the place of the novel in the culture is I'm trying to see, I'm still comparing myself to that original ideal of doing something useful. Uh, seeing that you're, what, what you want to do has utilitarian value, or, or, or is useful, or what? Um, I think, again, as I say, I used to think it was a useful thing to do, or should be a useful thing to do. There was a point at which I realized it's a fun thing to do. That is, reading a book should be a fun thing to do, and writing a book can be a fun thing to do. And I began to think that doing something that doesn't serve any obvious material purpose is not the least significant thing that a person can do, but in many ways the most significant thing you can do. Um, you know, while all the other species on Earth are trying to, you know, get ahead in the world, uh, we do these completely silly things. Uh, you know, write sentences, read sentences, daydream, um, and it's it's either it's either the, the the least significant or the most significant thing a human being can do. I think. I want to put now this book in that context. Um, you spent, perhaps, in contrast to earlier things, what was principal, what was what was essential here, and what was paramount here was the development of characters. That's right. Um, my first two books, I had taken a much more straightforward to, uh, approach to engaging with the culture and engaging with some socially interesting topics. I tried to do that with this third novel, and I found that I didn't really have anything original to say about what was wrong with the world. Um, and the idea of the novel as a cure for what, what ails the world 
um, was resulting in this kind of laborious uh, reportage or lab laborious raising of issues that I already knew uh, how to resolve. Um, and so I got bored and I got unhappy. And uh, at a certain point, a new set of characters came along, initially as peripheral characters in the book. And uh, I found that whenever I was writing about them, I was having a great time. And whenever I was writing about the other characters, I was bored. Um, so at a certain point after you know, procrastinating and beating myself up, I finally just threw out the whole lot of the, of the social novel and decided to write an old-fashioned family novel, uh, which is more or less what this is, with some, uh, some modernist flourishes. The modernist flourishes are what? Oh, I don't know. I think there's a, it's the, the way it's organized. It doesn't set out in this, you know, a hundred years ago there was an old man who lived in the village of right. Kursk. Uh, you know, it's uh, some of the some of the handling it's of time. About, and it's all about the character and their relationship. I mean, the, that's the, right. The, that's right. The, the, the driving narrative device, I guess, is the notion of of coming home for one last Christmas. You have a you have a family where the father, authoritarian, powerful figure, is suddenly falling apart. He's uh, uh, having these episodes of dementia, has Parkinson's disease. It's a crisis for the family and all the kids who are grown, living on the East Coast, uh, really just don't want to deal. And meanwhile, the unfortunate uh, mother in the family has to live with this man. And uh, because her present reality is so terribly unpleasant, she fixes her hopes on bringing the family together for that one last Christmas. Yes, that's the... Um, that's the simple conceit at the heart of the book. And the cons also it is the relationship among all of them. I mean, of course, one of course. child loves the father more than the mother, another child loves the mother more than the father. And, and, the, and, the, ki and the kids are all in varying degrees kind of East Coast sophisticates, and the parents are, have one or both feet in a much more traditional, um, well-ordered uh, heartland society. And there are all sorts of misunderstandings and conflicts there. Um, the mother thinks that the daughter is a snob. Uh, the daughter does seem to have a problem with rolling her eyes at what the mother says. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a family, you know. The reason I want you to establish the notion of utilitarian value okay. is that it, clearly you believe, someone once said, many people have said this in a variety of <clears> different ways, in the end what matters is family. In the end what matters most is not the National Book Award, but in the end it is... Well, when family. In my life, work and family. Okay. Um, well, but you'll get a there. A hap yeah. You're at a young part of your life. Or no, but I have, no, but it's, uh, to me, it thinks, I feel happy when, you know, I, I feel connected to people I, and when I have work to do. I, I understand, Mr. Freud. I got your point. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but I mean, in the end, in a sense, I'm trying to make the point is that you are saying something important here about family and about a, a, a commentary on dysfunctionality and the nature of relationships and you are exploring them in a way that you hope the reader will see something in terms of well um, I'm gonna I'm gonna fight you just a little bit more right, on that and that my my primary hope is that the reader have an experience that is be taken up in a book suspended carried along have a great time along the way ideally laugh ideally cry think sure but think not in a, you know, we're going to make you think about things way, but think, um, think because it's fun to think sometimes. Uh, and I think there's a distinction there between having a, a, a message that I'm trying yeah. to convey and trying to render um, my experience of the world and share that with someone else. And, you know, I, I, th this is a book that was written from a rather lonely place. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, we... People are lonely. Um, you're, you're alone with yourself, and, 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 and novels are about connecting across the great gaps from you know, the rather lonely center of one person to the rather lonely center of another. I'm not, I, I'm not positive that's a useful thing to do. Um, I think it's a pleasurable thing to do, uh, and it's something I'm committed to. But I'm, I, I don't know if you could like see the uh, lowered suicide rate or lower oh, hospital, no, no, I don't hospitalization mean that, rate. No, no, no. But I think there is some value in terms of self-examination and some value in terms of seeing through the gift of a novelist human experience that you somehow helps you understand your own human experience. Well, if if someone gets that from the book, that's great. But, but it's a byproduct for you. It's for not me, what you hope they'll see. Bec I think so. I think that's safe to say. Yeah, um, I, 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 I've become kind of a hardliner on the, uh, the Ivy Singer 
line about the primary responsibility of the novelist is to tell a story. Um, that is, that's, that's number one, and, you know, two, three, and four are way behind. And social criticism is even further behind? It used to be very important to me. At this point, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, it's less important in my life, I would say, um, and it's, it's, it's become more of a background thing in the books as well. You said the book was written from a lonely place. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, uh, it's solitary being a writer, um, and I think I felt a particular... It was written in the 90s. It was, uh, and the 90s, things were going great, as we know, uh, for most of the 90s. Um, but I was struggling. I was struggling, uh, as we were saying earlier, with this idea of, you know, is there any point to what I'm doing? Um, I felt like much of the rest of the world was, you know, had their money well invested. Uh, I didn't have any money to be well invested. I was in this little room up in Harlem working away on this book that I wasn't getting anywhere with. Um, and the day consists of 8, 10, 12 hours of seeing no one and talking to no one. Um, and additionally feeling as if I was in leaving behind the social content, that direct engagement with the world, um, I was finding my way to um, these places in myself, these emotional places in myself, which felt very shameful to me, very, very exposing to, to even think about writing about. And I think that, um, that deepened my feeling of estrangement and aloneness. And what's happened now in the last three months is there's been this wonderful uh, turnaround where people are coming up to me and saying, I recognize myself in that. And I thought I was writing the weirdest book. I thought I was writing about, you know, characters with very, very strange problems. And, you know, what I'm being bombarded with now is that's my sister. That's my dad. That's so my what does that tell you? It tells me, um, I think it tells me that my instinct to leave behind the, uh, the, the, the kind of more broad canvassed uh, social novel was, um, was good. Um, it tells me that there is a hunger on the part of readers for uh, complicated depictions of family, um, complicated depictions of anxiety, um, that people don't want lessons, that people want experiences um, in a book. Characters and, and stories characters and stories. share experiences. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of, I feel like... Hello? Fiction 101. <laughs> Hello? Fiction 101. I mean, go figure. <laughs> you had to go like this and come back here. Huh? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It was a long road. What um, got you there? What got me um, over the hump? Yeah, or, or we get to be able to do this. Or to know that you had to do this. Um, or to do this. Uh, I encountered difficulty in life, um, to put it simply. Uh, writing had been easy for me when I was in my 20s. I got these two books out, and it seemed like, what's so hard about this? All before you were 30. Yeah, um, yeah I thought my second book came out, I just turned 30. Um, and uh, suddenly, I was, first of all, having trouble writing a third novel. Um, had sort of, in my private life, things were not going so well. and. Uh, uh, but first one of my parents, my father, and then my mother got sick. Both of them uh, died. Um, and those experiences were so, um, so overwhelming that, you know, am I going to really try to do another scene exposing the harmful effects of techno-consumerism, or am I going to write about what it's like uh, to see your father falling apart? Um, and uh, I'm not sure it was a conscious, you know, there's the hill, I'm going to cross over it into the, mm. you know, uh, 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 down to Salt Lake City. Um, it was more like, I have no choice. This, there's no food here. Um, maybe on the other side of that hill, there's something, something will nourish me. So I think that's what happened. You, in part, were motivated by your own experiences. Of course, yeah. I mean, I, well, I say of course, even though it had been a point of pride with me in my first two books, not to take a single incident from my real life, um, invent absolutely everything. And even in this book, almost all of the incidents are invented. But uh, I decided, and I, and in the first two books again, I was I was quite hard line about uh, inventing characters from scratch. 
I might take a physical gesture from one person and an attitude from another, but I really was very intent on making composites so that no one could come up to me and say, that's just like X. Um, and I let go of that a little bit here. People come up to me and say, this must be your mother. Well, it's, you know, it's not my mother, but, but it's more like my mother than the mothers in my other books were, that's for sure. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll cop to that, you know. It's, uh, I don't know why it had been such a point of pride with me. Um, maybe because I was bent on protecting my privacy, the privacy of people around me, which I still am, but I loosened up just a little bit. When you created these characters, um, did the story come from the characters or did the story come somewhere else? I think the characters are the story. Um, I think that uh, their situations are constitutive of what they are. Um, for example, um, the opening main, the opening big section is about a, uh, a failed literary theorist turned failed screenwriter. His name is Chip. He's I one think, of the three sons. He's one of the three, one three sons. Children. One, of the three ch one of the three Lambert children. Right. Um, he owes his sister a great deal of money. And this is, this is the torment of his life, is that he's, he's borrowed money from his sister and he spent it for all intents and purposes on nothing. He's just throwing the money away. And he has this horrible debt. I think that, you know, I think I did start with a, a kind of a gestural sense of who Chip was, but really, it, it, that debt is, in significant part, what Chip is. He is that horrible debt that chases him from one career into another and finally chases him all the way to Eastern Europe. Um, uh, so I, it's hard for me to distinguish situation and story from character. They develop kind of at the same time. I start with a, a sense of the general territory I want. I may start with a, a face I've seen or a person I've met. Um, but really it's in developing, trying to figure out what the dramatic situation is that I get to know the character. Some book editor said about, because part of what you've talked about in this famous, I think, 96 piece in Harvard, was it 96? Yeah. yeah. Uh, which you talked about the novel and television and the dominance of television. And some editor, book editor, said, well, you can't talk about themes on television. Uh, we talk about themes all the time, the themes in movies and the themes of, in a sculpture's life and all kinds of things. But in, are there themes here beyond what we've talked about I mean, in terms of, of, of what? Oh, it's sort of a theme fest, I think. Yeah, that's what right I mean. Down there's no, but there's no driving single theme. It is the th what? Well, there is, I mean, there's the title theme, the corrections. I was going to get to that. But, yeah. But um, ex well, elaborate on that. Well, um, I think the theme... That's Lives can be corrected. Or the, the, our, our belief or delusion or hope that we can make things better. Um, uh, certainly each of the children has, has set his or her life up in opposition as, as some kind of correction to mm -hmm. what they thought of as their parents' mistakes. Um, of course, you correct one set of mistakes only to create another. You tear down the tenements and you put in the beautiful high-rise housing projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, century abounds with failed corrections. Yeah, um, yeah. But also... Uh, Which was sort of the basis of one of your novels. Uh, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, Urban Renewal, right. another failed correction. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, but secondarily, or, or alongside that, um, I had, from an early time, before I had any of these characters, I had been thinking of writing this other novel, the social novel, um, with a lot of stock market stuff in it. And I was very struck by the kind of, the, the graph of a stock that has come, come unmoored from its actual value. Um, Amazon Lots stock. of them did, yes. yes. We, have, we have, again, uh, recent history of bands <laughs> yeah. with well, examples. Um, the dot-com implosion and an explosion. And it, it was striking to me that as, as, as it's becoming unmoored from reality, it's kind of gently rising like that. But the return to reality seldom is back oh, like it's that. It's, it's like, <laughs> yeah. and then the bubble bursts and you're down like that. Yeah. And that, um, that, that was reminiscent of my own experience of uh, failing to face up to some unpleasant reality, um, becoming more and more uh, anxious and unhappy. And, uh, About your failure to have broken through in terms of... No, no, say, say um, 
I wrote a piece not long ago about my father's uh, succumbing to Alzheimer's right. disease. Right. And what I was trying to get at in that was the ways in which my mother and I, uh, much less, uh, to a much smaller extent, my brothers, um, did not want to recognize what was going on with him. Um, and it really took for her, it took uh, you know, a bad weekend at my uncle's in Indiana when you know, suddenly things were so out of control she could no longer pretend. It crashed in suddenly. She could no longer pretend that this was just some weird reaction to medications. Um, and I had my own experience of suddenly realizing, you know, this man is very sick. Um, so I'd seen it, I, it was really in my private life that I'd seen this, uh, this kind of growing construct of, um, se of self-deception um, and flight from the unpleasant reality and had also seen how when that comes to an end it will happen suddenly. Uh, so that, that became the template for the stories of all the kids and the parents. You've said a lot. Um, we've gone 25 minutes without mentioning the word Oprah. Oh, those, they've been a very pleasant 25 minutes. <laughs> I want to do that but also because it's sort of been part of, I've never seen so much written about what seems to me to be unless there's a commentary about it, which seems to me to be just something that took place because somebody, for whatever reason, said no, and then someone else, for whatever reason, said, oh, well, I understand where he's coming from. Maybe we should disinvite him. Where, where, do you, where are you on this issue that uh, you did not have expressed reservations about appearing on Oprah's book club uh, and then were subsequently disinvited and, and lots of commentary about this? Where am I with the issue? Um, I think there have been points in the last few weeks when the, um, the degree of uh, misquotation or partial quotation of me and the degree of antipathy toward me has been angering. But I've kind of reached a point where um, it seems, first of all, I'm ready for it to be over. I think it is nearly over. It also seems, um, at a certain point, it seems amusing and indicative of something else, that there's been so much about this. Um, you know, that, that anger, which uh, was preceded by uh, real remorse uh, when I began to see um, how some of the things I'd said in certain interviews would sound to Oprah Winfrey, um, I, my take on it is that it was, a, it was kind of a, um, it was an uneasy fit to begin with, her and me, and we were both sort of reaching towards each other. And then there was, there, was a, there was a misunderstanding, set of misunderstandings. I didn't deal with the media well. Um, she made an entirely reasonable decision. It's her TV show, not to have me on. I had no problem with that. I, I mean, I'd been doing work to prepare for the show. I was ready to do it. Um, but again, I, there was no rancor. At no point was I aware, either on her part or on my part, of any rancor between us. Um, so it's, it's been strange that so much rancor has built up around people it. People writing about it, people taking sides, taking people sides, accusing... Taking getting out the, you know, the, the 60 millimeter, you know, the, the, the guns, the... But most people seem to have taken her side. Um, Whatever her side was. Her side was basically that uh, I've decided to disinvite someone because I feel like they... Well, and even I'm on that side. My show. I'm on her side with that because I think it's her show. Right. She's an enter, you know, she's an entertainer. Uh, she's a she's a media personality. She knows the media better than I do. That's the whole problem. I'm a writer. You know, I went out as um, having been in that that isolated dark place for uh, years. Um, I suddenly stepped out into these bright lights, and it was a while before I realized that you know I was no longer having private conversations, and I was meeting all these readers who. In addition to saying, well, gosh, that's my brother, that's my mother, we're saying, um, it's so great, Oprah picked your book. Um, I love it, and I think it's a real, you know, it's a, it's a reach for her, and I think it means so much that she's trying to do books like this with her club. And just as many people saying, I love your book, I think it's terrible she picked it. Um, we yeah. felt like that was ours. Oh, well, there were some people who also said, if I'd known it was picked by Oprah, I wouldn't have read it. Right. Right, exactly. So I was getting both of those things, and I would try to, you know, with one kind of reader, I'd say one thing. With another, I'd try to say one, another, because I, I kind of agreed with both. Um, it's it's my, uh, my nature to be divided about things. Um, but I think uh, what I was hearing even, even before I went out on the road, both the Times Magazine and the, and the Times Book Review had said, this will never be an Oprah book. 
uh, Oprah's own producers were saying, this is a hard book for us. So there was all this sense that um, this is a difficult thing. And my, my mistake was that I didn't, um, I should have just been quiet about it. And because I wasn't, I, I laid myself open to criticism. And I, I said things that I think she was right to be hurt by. But you also said once, and, and some people really jumped on this, that you were solidly in the high art literary tradition. Well, I think the sentence went on from there to say, but I love entertaining books, and I think Oprah Winfrey is part of bridging that gap. Yeah, right. That's the complete sentence there. Um, whatever sixth interview of the day I uttered, <laughs> what I meant was, you know, I read these, these books by people who don't sell that well. They're very important to me, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very strange thing to suddenly jump from you know, Kafka and Conrad into, into you know, selling a million books in a few months territory. Um, and that's, uh, that's a weird disjunction for the writer, the writer I, I really think. What would you do differently? What would I do differently? Gosh. Um, I think, first of all, I wish I'd seen her, um, her televised endorsement of the book because when I finally was told what she said I think it would have put in my head just how far how much she was behind it and how she really was to some extent in her own view and in the view of her producers going out on the limb to pick the book um, and I think I would have been more careful and more grateful in what I said um, and otherwise I think well I would certainly not have used the word high art which no, I used like <laughs> once in those 120 interviews and I everybody like, latched onto that oh, so oh fast oh my god yeah. no it's, uh, it's I, I would have used the word marginal perhaps mm -hmm. rather than high um, uh, and that's it's been dismaying to see that this is like this is now you know suddenly I'm because everybody will immediately rush in and tell you that there have been people who've written great literature that's sold well Exactly. Exactly. Well, and I, I mean, I'm. This book is about reaching all those kinds of readers. I mean, I'm writing for all. That's one of the reasons it took so long. I wanted to write a book that would be for everybody, um, and I think she was able to pick it because it is for everybody. On the one hand, I had the kind of hipsters saying, "No way, Oprah," and yeah. on the other hand, there was Oprah, saying. Um, this, this is a book well, for everyone. Well, I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that enter into this. I mean, it's almost yeah. like it's worth writing about because there's so many subject matter, so much interesting things about it, including who is her audience and what kinds of ideas you write about and what appeal to those kinds of, of feelings, experiences, and ideas in the book among the characters have to do with ideas, feelings, and experiences of her audience and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've actually studied, in the, in the Harper's essay, I was talking about having studied who reads fiction in this country. Right. I, I, more than anybody else, know that there is no such thing as a certain kind of reader. Right. You know, there are people in prison who are reading uh, Celine and Kafka and, right. and, and Proust. Um, uh, you know, the, probably more so than most places exactly. because they have more time. But they but they came in there without a high school degree, <laughs> exactly. and they find their way to those books. I mean, there's you know there's just uh, very very different kinds of people find their way to work, and I know that. Um, and I think that it was uh, the worst of this for me is this idea that I have something against certain kinds of readers. There was, you know, it's really it's it's about a discomfort. I mean, that is the, that ought to be the worst thing about it. it. And it, it really ought to do that. Yeah. You have some disdain for people that I, somehow just, they shouldn't be reading my books. It's not for them. It's too you know. It's ought. it's a grievous misunderstanding because I really feel truly the opposite of that. Um, finally, uh, you have also made. Uh, uh, and I applaud aspiration that you were going to write a great American novel. In the Did I say that? Or something like <laughs> that. <laughs> is this it for you? In other words, is this the great American novel that you wanted to write, or is this just simply one more very good book in an evolution, albeit this one has received more attention, more awards, so more than anything you've ever done? Um, well, this is kind of a mid-course correction. Um, hmm. They're a funny, <laughs> funny thing. I think it, it was a transitional book. That's why it took so long to get it out. Um, I have a whole body of experience and thinking and characters so I'm very eager to get back to for the new book. So this is not my last book, that's for sure. Uh, for sure. Uh, Jonathan Friends and the Corrections, a novel, uh, the National Book Award. It doesn't get any better than that. Uh, I'm pleased to have him here and we will talk uh, more about books and literature and novels and family um, on other shows and I look forward to that with Jonathan. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.